Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of NBS Radio. It's been a minute, so we have uh, plenty of content to cover since our last show. And joining me today are two of my guests, one of which is a first-timer as a broadcaster here on NBS. So today, for the viewing pleasure, or, or listening pleasure, rather, of our audience, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves first. Would you like to say hello, Ara? Hello. Uh, my real name is Sam, which you might prefer to use because my username is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> and I'm English. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, returning broadcaster, everyone's favorite, the, uh, I don't even, Ruben, what are you? Like, what is your, what is your, like, emblem or animal? Everyone always has one. Oh, I don't know. I guess I'm a pigeon. Okay, you're a pigeon. Fair enough. Like, MCM was, like, the lion. Ghost is, like, the specter, obviously, like, the ghost sprite. Gurundu is kind of like the Pikachu face, I think. Is Gurundu, like, the avocado? Oh, yeah, he's the avocado. Yeah, that's, yeah. Everyone always seems to have, like, some theme or whatever, so I was like... Yeah, and Chipotle has, like, the dove something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that peace emoji. Exactly. Uh, We're already getting off on a tangent, and it is less than two minutes into the broadcast. (laughs) All right. So, um, let's actually jump into our first topic here. Obviously, the most significant development uh, in our last show, aptly named Midterm Madness, we covered the series of resignations from the cabinet. That occurred as well as uh, the RA looking into possible recalls of the ex-delegate. The now ex-delegate, I might mention. Uh, As we can now report that uh, a successful recall motion uh, has been achieved in the regional assembly. So we are now currently in a acting delegacy period with acting delegate Chipoli, a.k.a. the former minister of WA Affairs. What I should note to our listeners is for those who maybe are not in the swing of things or in the in the no, if you will, is that uh, there were actually two votes on this recall. The first of which failed uh, amidst much controversy, and the second one succeeded, uh, overwhelmingly so, I believe. And there actually didn't need to be a final count on the second one because of the resignation of Delegate Garantu. Two recall votes, one failed, one seemed as though it was succeeding. Uh, obviously, it was rendered unnecessary due to the uh resignation and now we're this is where we are now with the acting delegacy period the second acting delegacy period uh within the last half a year it's gotta gotta come to some bit of a surprise ara as someone who's a bit uh newer to our region maybe and maybe hasn't been around that long um this is not obviously how things normally turn out but what what have you what have you observed mostly that you feel um, you know just general just general trends in the region as far as it going through this sort of trying time? What do you think's been you know? Well, firstly, it was, it was quite disheartening, you know, to see the kind of toxicity that we saw on the Discord and the forum, um, and I think I think it also shows how fragile things can be, you know first opened as a thread about a period of inactivity from Gurundu and then it ended up causing like a region-wide crisis so yeah yeah and that that was something that uh was brought up throughout these sort of whole ordeal was just the general um discourse that was going on between the citizenry as far as um the events were concerned you had people on both sides obviously taking up very different arguments but the overall sentiment seemed to uh, revolve generally around tone and around, you know, the way in which people were saying what they were saying, which uh, it ended it ended up, uh, things have cooled off now, obviously, but it did get quite heated for a bit. Uh, what was your experience with that, Ruben, from your point of view? Well, um, as one of the more vocal members of this discussion and probably arguably or well not arguably definitely one of the more toxic people in this discussion um i can say that it was a very negative very um hostile environment to uh discuss uh the situation and um as i've contributed it to the uh situation or well the hostility myself because of my aggressive behavior um, I, I did think it was, well, it was just 
very difficult to traverse and to choose uh, the right wording and the right tone. Um, but in the end, we came out uh, to a, a result which I thought was uh, pretty satisfying. But yeah, the general tone and the general vibe, if you can call it that, uh, of the region at that time was not very pleasant, to say the least. I think that uh, vibe is probably a good way to put it. Anytime, you know, we don't see this often, thankfully, but anytime there's just absolute turmoil, as we were describing um, in the last broadcast, you, you get, you know, a lot of differing opinions naturally, but also, you know, just some um, differences flare in a way that can sort of culminate in that. Uh, I think it's particularly... Not ironic, but funny in the sense that as we're recording this, you you are self-admitted toxic Ruben uh, for the purposes of this broadcast. I, you know, I, I think it's one of those situations, uh, you know, it happens to people. I don't think, you know, we can necessarily let it define us. And I obviously had a hand in that as well. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, I, I will say that the admin team's message, uh, rather moderation's message to the server as far as just general respectful discourse and, you know, the speaker's office also kind of reiterated that in the regional assembly channel is that, yeah, obviously debate's going to occur. I mean, that's literally in our motto. The debate is robust. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it does need to remain constructive or at least e even, even if it's not necessarily constructive, because as we do have a tendency to talk in circles, it does need to at least remain professional, respectful, etc. Uh, and I and I think that's a reasonable expectation. That's what you want uh, from a community as storied and as proud as ours. But it does happen. It does happen. And uh, thankfully, I, I, you know, am a bit hesitant to say that we're out of the weeds yet because I, I don't ever want to make that call before it's necessarily happened. Uh, but, but we are definitely out of the thick of things. Um, and I think that resignation definitely uh, signified it well. But moving on from that, we do have to talk about what has happened after the resignation. So, of course, per the uh, line of succession, the former vice delegate Chipoli ascended to the acting delegacy, and the first security counselor in the line of succession, Ghost, a.k.a. Paleith, has become the acting vice delegate. That is the state of affairs currently in which uh, the acting delegate, Cipolli, delivered an address that saw the return of Frigerson as Minister of Foreign Affairs. I reference our last broadcast pretty often so far in this show, but I will say um, Frigerson was one of the cabinet members who resigned previously. Uh, they've returned to the role. Ruben, I know that you're involved with uh, foreign affairs more so than I am these days. Uh, would you say that, that is a pretty welcome return? Well, I mean, I personally disagreed with the appointment uh, because, well, I was not very satisfied with the activity levels shown by Minister uh, Craig and just uh, their general policy, where there was a lot of um, where there was a lot of responsibility put on the staffers themselves and a little bit of more. A hands-off approach, which I'm personally not a fan of. Um, so in that sense, not really. But it's obviously great that we have a Minister of Foreign Affairs again. So in that sense, yes, it's very much a welcome return. Yeah, and, and for those who are curious or might be a bit confused by this, uh, Garanti was previously, uh, simultaneously, Delegate and Minister of Foreign Affairs. The aforementioned resignation uh, included them stepping down from the Minister of Foreign Affairs position, uh, as they deemed it to be right. So that became vacant. Chipoli filled it, obviously, with a returning minister. And, uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, I can't necessarily speak to maybe what Frag did or didn't do in the ministry uh, last term previously. But what I will say is that I, I think there's definitely... A message being sent as far as former ministers willing to come back. And obviously, in the interest of the region, I would like to see those ministers excel and succeed. 
Um, this kind of gives away what we were going to talk about next, but Chipotle did make uh, a couple of other appointments, that being Ghost returning to uh, his position as advisor to the delegate in uh, very unfamiliar ter- or, or very familiar territory, rather, for him. Obviously, he was part of those mass resignations. He's coming back. And joining him as an advisor to the delegate is uh, yours truly. I am also an advisor to the delegate, Delegate Chipotle. So, yeah, that was going to kind of, I needed to get that out of the way to preempt what I'm about to say, which is that uh, since joining or rejoining the administration, rather, I do think it is good to see some of these ministers um, accomplishing or at least making progress towards accomplishing what we'd like to see from these areas. Uh, just their general enthusiasm, I think that's been quite good with Lion's Roar, Nutmeg, some of the newer ministers, some of the newer talent that we have. Um, Lion's Roar, maybe a bit less so in the sense of new, um, but obviously a staple of the cabinet nonetheless. It has been good to see that in their growth up close, and I can definitely say that uh, I'd like to see it continue, and I'd like to see it carry over to this next term. Ara, as you're obviously one of the up-and-coming staffers, specifically in comms, is there any one area of government that you'd really like to see something from as we enter this new term? Well, actually, I've been thinking about this, and I think it is actually home affairs, unfortunately, even with what you said about Lion's Hall. Um I think, but the only thing, I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm not a staff in home affairs, so I can't see everything, but the only thing I've seen from the Discord is birthday party um, strike group stuff, and this isn't like a, um, anything against Lionel because I know that there's a lot of technology that has been done that previously used to help Home Affairs in its activities. But I think that's some, I think that ministry is probably the one that needs to be given a bit of a boost the most. Yes, I can comment on that as a deputy minister of Home Affairs. Um, it is true that uh, a lot of the stuff that we do does not happen in the uh, Home Affairs uh, public channel. It it all happens exclusively in designated uh, areas. Um, but despite that, the activity levels are not as high as one could desire. And that's absolutely not um, Lion's Roar's fault at all because they've been very diligent with um, their responsibilities, but the staff is just uh, not there with uh, their activity, which, um, at least uh, in my opinion, is because the tasks are just not that fun. Um, I personally have not done a single list or anything of the sort at all because I just find it so incredibly uninteresting and I don't want to do it basically and uh, mentees uh, as in forum mentors are also very uh, slowly being blamed so it's not due to anything Lions Roar has done or doesn't do Um, it's merely because we have inactive staff or unwilling staff because we just have the most boring ministry ever. I've I've remarked on this before, maybe not on air, but certainly I think uh, in public view, that, you know, it used to be, whether we like it or not, it used to be that home affairs could kind of, you know, ride the wave a bit as far as doing lists and its productivity. Um. And in my view, that really can no longer continue to be the case for the simple fact that uh, frontiers and strongholds are here and our spawns are being cut down. And because of that, uh, I think that it would definitely behoove that area of government if we could, you know, see those productivity number or the production from that area increase in a way that sort of supplements the lack of spawns that we're getting. Uh, or the the lesser share of spawns that we're getting. Because, you know, I I don't want us to ever enter a situation in which we coast by off of our GCR status. That is uh, one of the last things I and many others would like to see. I think that for a while, we could get away with it, you know, just by virtue of being TNP, being who we were, 
And yeah, you know, H.A. would come in and do lists and this and that sometimes, but at the end of the day, it was all about the spawns. It was all about new nations showing up and getting involved. It was always about, you know, getting them to be citizens and citizenship retention and this and that. Well, I think Frontiers and Strongholds has really added a new dimension to it, and maybe we've, you know, some have spoken about it previously, but it really is that it, it gets more difficult to get people in the door, and, you know, if H.A., is having trouble getting them in the door, then I definitely think that that's something that the next delegate, whoever it is, will have to take a look at and seriously examine to see, you know, to make up for the lack of spawns, how are we going to treat the spawns that we do get? How are we going to nurture them to uh, integrate them as parts of our community and really make sure that they're given the best opportunity to participate and stuff like that? I definitely think that that becomes more important uh, in a frontiers and strongholds landscape is basically, you know, what I'm saying. And, you know, I think many others would agree. I, I think that's pretty fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, completely agree with that. Um, I think home affairs definitely needs some um, revising or rearranging, so to speak, um, in the sense that their tasks are incredibly dull and people need to be uh, motivated to do them and currently that motivation is not there um, so the next delegate and the next minister definitely need to uh, look at that because it's definitely an issue um, a large issue as home affairs is basically the leading um factor or like uh, they give us basically new talent um, they make it so people join the discord join and uh, the regional assembly join the government etc um, so it's definitely one of the more important ministries that is currently dead in the water so to speak um, so it's definitely a shame but it has to be tackled by um, the next delegate and the next minister of home affairs, whoever they may be. Yeah, on the subject of the ministries, uh, you know, just to kind of bring up more of a positive, in, you know, to weigh against that negative, obviously, is that uh, we saw that Nutmeg, the Minister of Culture, uh, during the time where everything was, uh, you know, kind of, in question as far as who was going to stay and who was going to leave that they they said that they kind of wanted to just keep their head down and work on culture and i will say that through this acting delegacy period that seems to um uh, have half paid dividends we do see you know music mondays still being held we do see theme thursdays being held i know that recently although this is not a culture initiative uh, i've kind of started posting what i call the community questions series where Every day, I kind of just ask the R&B something random. And I actually brought it up to both Lions Roar and Nutmeg the other day just to make sure that we weren't already doing something like that. And as it turns out, we're not. So, hey, that works out. Uh, we've done it before, but currently, I just wanted to make sure because obviously, it was never my intention to, like, make it a government, like, sponsored thing. But it is just another way that we can, like, reach out to people and engage with them and let them know that, hey, we're here. Like, people in the region are, you know, uh, interacting, whether you're on the RMB or in Discord or on the forums or even in the RP server, we've got all these different areas of our community that uh, need to be held together. And yeah, HA plays a part in that, but I think I kind of do want to bring it back and say that it's not necessarily HA that does it all, uh, even with or without their staff. It's definitely each one of us that like we can do something about it in a way, even if it's a very small way. And I think uh, after the region has had sort of like trying times as of late, it's definitely something that she kind of got to, you know, make that extra effort for. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but home affairs is, of course, the ministry task with integration. And when that fails, well, then we're just bound to uh, get, I don't know, go for its eighth term uh, as a delegate. So uh, we obviously don't want that. So we uh, need good or better integration to get new blood, new talent uh, 
into uh, the best specific. I would. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ara. Well, thanks. All right. Um, I think just I j- just what I think in, in engagement on the R and B is probably because most people, most nations in the North Pacific aren't on the forum. Well, or, or at least not active. Um, I think the R and B is the best way to keep those nations that perhaps don't want so much drama as we see on the forum. Um. You know, in response to what Ruben said, I wouldn't be so hasty. I'm not sure that uh, we wouldn't want that. I'm sure that there are some out there who would want that. Uh, but we're kind, of, we're kind of foreshadowing maybe another future segment of this broadcast in which we, uh, if we, if we so choose, a fan of the speculation, you know, the rumor mill, if you will, for the upcoming election. Uh, but no, I mean, obviously... You know, anytime that you have something like as big as these developments happening, uh, it is kind of going to come down to who who is around, who can do things, who can you know be re- relied upon. But what one thing that I do want to um, sort of stress is that the past two vice delegates have ascended to the vice delegacy, and so it's been brought up before, most recently. The the joke is, oh, whoever whoever gets elected vice delegate, they just they get elected delegate anyway because they'll be delegate. But I do think that I- there is sort of a renewed importance um, instilled in the minds of the citizens as far as who they're trusting to head up the security branch of government, uh, because yes, that person might be called upon, and as we saw with Chipoli, uh, they were called upon. They said back when they got elected that they'd be willing to do so if it was required of them. And as it turns out, that was required. So here we are today. Um, and so far, yes, the duty of any acting delegate is to you know, keep keep the ship afloat, make sure that things are alive and well. And, you know, as far as tackling challenges, I'm sure that uh, he's up to the task as far as that, but yes, the new, the next delegate, whether it be Chipoli or someone else, uh, will have to tackle the issues that both uh, Ruben and Ara, you, you two have mentioned. Uh, yeah, and I think um, I think Chipoli's doing a really good job at the moment because he, I think, I don't think it's the time for any new policy. I think obviously we need to keep the usual activities in um, the ministries going, but I think. As he as he said in his opening statement, I think it's more about unifying the region after this very trying time, and kind of waiting until the election so that kind of someone has a mandate and they can have more of a jump point to um towards what they want to do really. Right, and I think that was said by Chipoli in the in the same statement is that hey guys, you know I'm here. You didn't necessarily vote for me to be here. It could be argued by proxy you did because you knew that that was a mechanism that happened. But by all by for all intents and purpose, uh, Chipotle even admitted like, hey, you know, I understand you, you guys didn't think I you didn't necessarily vote back in May with the idea that I'd be here. And that, you know, I, I like seeing that sort of awareness um, from someone. I think that that's, you know, it's important to remember that simply because you're in the acting delegacy or the acting vice delegacy doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically inherit the mandate to govern. But right now, as things stand, you know, Chipoli is our legitimate delegate. And yeah, I think that they've done a good job in uh, being aware that, yeah, this is this is the state of affairs currently, and here's how things have to progress in order to get us to the next term where a renewed mandate can occur uh, from someone else being elected. Uh, sort of shifting gears, I mentioned Freg returning to FA. There is a uh, pretty notable FA development uh, that has occurred recently, and this is going to be some foreshadowing. I'm not going to say it yet. I'm not going to announce it yet, but it might be coming. The staffers know what I'm talking about, but maybe some people in the audience don't. So here's what we're going to do. Over a decade of friendship between TNP and Europea. This was uh, a recent milestone that was crossed. Obviously, outgoing president, or actually fully out president at this point, uh, planned, sort of signed on to a joint statement with uh, Chipotle in which they announced that, yes, 
It has been over a decade since the treaty between the North Pacific and the Republic of Europea uh, first came into effect. So yeah, on that front, on the FA front, that's a pretty big milestone, a decade. Uh, I haven't even been playing the game for a decade. I know that there are many who have, but I am not one of such people. Um, and I hear, this is a rumor, but I hear that there might be uh, future festivities planned between the two regions yet to be announced. You'll have to ask, uh, you'll have to ask JD about that. We'll see. Congratulations to JD on their election as a uh, president of Europea, by the way. I think, yeah, absolutely. You're in, you're in Europea, aren't you? Well, I was until my citizenship, uh, like it, it was just gone at some point because I never post on their forums or RMB or anything like that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Europea, obviously, an ally in the independent sphere, uh, treaty ally. Well, independent, independent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and uh, partners in both Wall and the Heroes of Valhalla project. And the Olympics. What was that? And the uh, Olympics. Oh, yes, yes, the Euro Olympics. A recent event. A recent event. That was another thing. Nutmeg helped uh, stay around and plan, and, and again, that did pay dividends. It came to fruition with the uh, TNP's participation in the Euro Olympics. Um, we didn't do that well. No, maybe not, but it was it was quite bad in some It was quite nice to see, nonetheless, uh, that it did end up happening. And yeah, shortly thereafter, it marks our celebrating a decade, TNP Europea's anniversary of friendship. So yeah, I did want to go ahead and mention that as a nice little feel good moment. That even in times that you know the regions having internal difficulties, as far as the foreign network of things, uh, there is some long standing strength. Of, I don't want to say solidarity, but you you get what I mean. It might trigger our ex TCB or here, but yeah, solidarity. Oh, there, oh, there. I mean, we're both. I was about to say, I was about to say, it's not like you're. Yeah, I mean, don't pull this on me. <laughs> no, no, no. I no. uh, might have flashbacks, but yeah, no. Uh, we, we've talked about the executive basically as an overarching summary uh, for everyone who wants a little recap. Grunds you out, Chipotle in, returning minister, returning advisor. A new advisor appointed as well, and uh, an announcement with uh, friendship with Europea. So yeah, that's what we've seen so far in the acting delegacy period. And obviously, there's numerous things going on internally that um, I'm sure will become more apparent as time goes on. But uh, like like Ara was saying, from an acting delegacy period, the the final month, the term, um, the bar is where it's at, and. I would say that I'm decently satisfied with uh, Chipotle. I think that they've done a good job. And obviously, by working with them, I know a bit more than maybe what people see on the outside. But uh, I, I fully believe in, obviously, I fully believe in their approach and mentality. Otherwise, I wouldn't agree to stand by them. But yeah. All right. Moving over to the regional assembly. There's a number of things going on here that have happened since our uh, last show. Amendments being proposed, uh, some uh, pieces of legislation being passed. So let's go ahead and start with uh, maybe the elephant in the room that we were just speaking on. The North Pacific has passed a prohibition of relations with the communist law. That is under Section 7.7 of the legal code. Uh, So the RA using its power to uh, delegate TCB as a prohibited region. I I almost I I know what Ruben might say about this, so I almost want to ask you, Ara, because this is this is also something that doesn't usually happen. I don't. It's not happened before since I've been here. Anyway, we're we're having a we're having a first time for a lot of these things here, which is both exciting and scary if you think about it. Like exciting in the sense that legislative activity, yay, we're doing these different things. Democracy is alive and well. Which, by the way. I will say that for the RA votes, the turnout on a lot of these recent RA votes has been tremendous. So the citizenry is definitely still there and making their uh, opinions known. But at the same time, unfamiliar territory is always scary. So w- how are you feeling about this, Ara? Well, I think it goes without saying that I think TCB probably the um, worthy to be its first recipient. <laughs> um, 
because I mean, and I think their behavior has, is, you know, has called for that kind of action because I mean, they're obviously a region with quite a few, not everyone, because I know we have got some people here who were in TCB, but quite unpleasant people, both in and out of character. And I think we just don't want to be associated with them. And I don't think it's really a security thing. Um, but I also, I also think it's not, um, it's more of a, um, statement really, because it's not like we were prohibiting relations with Europea or Bulger or someone like that. It's, um, it's more of making it official because we already didn't have, did, had really bad relations with them. And so I think, yeah, it's more of a symbolic thing really. Yeah, we weren't going to have relations with them anyway. So this is really just the cherry on top is the thing. Mm. the cherry on top is a nice way to put it uh you know the way i see it it, it's more of a formality at this point and i think that's what a lot of people gathered from this move uh it was a foregone conclusion this is probably gonna end up succeeding in the ra Uh, i will note that there are some differing opinions of course i am going to um give those the consideration that they deserve as well i see gbm in our audience here one of one of such people, and this is actually, you know, a thing that was brought up reoccurringly, that as as a region, the identity of TNP uh, is that we're very welcoming. I know that in my case, I'd already played NS for a number of years before coming over to TNP, and we see people, you know, from all different regions who end up coming to TNP, and yeah, we're a pretty welcoming place that's open to a lot of different people. And that kind of is something special and worth valuing in our community. I would absolutely agree with that. Obviously, you know, through past legislation, the only people who we don't welcome are security risks and fascists. So that's, uh, it's, it's pretty open as far as what we are and aren't willing to tolerate. But yeah, kind of what Ara was saying, uh, I would say that TCB is a pretty deserving region of this designation. And yeah, it does further codify it. Because while I doubt that any future delegate uh, would, you know, think about actually constructing meaningful relations with them, this does further assert the RA's uh, say-so on the matter, where it's like, yeah, no, actually, that's not going to happen. Uh, You won't be doing that. So, yeah. I think, you know, there's obviously reasonable arguments on both sides as far as who we are as a region. Should we really be putting up these walls uh, between ourselves and others? But also, you know, what we are and aren't willing to tolerate. And do we think, you know, we were in a position to be able to say, hey, no, this is not going to happen. We're not for this. uh, And we don't want to associate ourselves with you. And I would say, yeah, TCB fits the bill as far as we do not want to associate ourselves with you. And I think um, to just adding to that, I think we also have, I think, you know, we we were just pointing out we already have like... um, the policy it's kind of an unspoken it's kind of an un- uncodified policy really about not supporting proposals by TCB authors um, which I think is already a pretty big step in kind of making sure that we um, officialize our hate officialize <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know. If hate, I don't know if hate's the correct word. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, didn't. I don't know if it, I, I think that's a bit harsh. I think uh, what's a better, a better, more oh, dislike. Exactly. Dislike. So strong dislike slash vehement disapproval. We'll go with that. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the best that can be said on this. Uh, for those for those wanting the official count as to, you know, how overwhelmingly this uh, was decided. I'll, I'll go ahead and provide that count for you, just just, just for the record. But uh, no. Per the Speaker's office, the A's had it at 51 to 5 to 17. That would be 5 nays, 17 abstentions. So, yeah. I did mention uh, I did mention GBM earlier, but GBM was among the A's. So that uh, if GBM doesn't like you, you have a serious problem. <laughs> and yeah, no. Uh, sort of in the same vein as business in the RA. 
uh, is currently still being debated, by the way, is the Universal Secret Ballot Amendment. And I know that there have been a, numerous thoughts on this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you both sort of a platform to give us your takes on it. But the general premise is, you know, we already allow secret ballots during general election cycles, judicial election cycles also, in which uh, the election commission will announce private ballots that protect the anonymity, that's how you pronounce it, of the voters. And, uh, you know, sort of as in reaction to maybe how polarizing a topic Grundu's final weeks in office were, the general reaction was people who want to vote a certain way shouldn't be targeted or overly you know, ostracized for their choices or criticized. Uh, so what if we were to extend that, uh, that ability to the RA and allow people in the RA to vote anonymously? That was that amendment that the proposed amendment rather was brought to us by Comped. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to each of you, uh, to sort of elaborate what your guys' thoughts on the proposed amendment are, and then I'll go ahead and offer my own sort of at the end. Well, uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, I haven't followed this situation particularly, um, but what I can gather from it, at least at the moment, is that it basically just allows people to vote anonymously in the regional assembly, basically, right? Yes, that is that is what it would achieve if uh, it were better. Yeah, I mean, why not? People can do that if they want. I have no issue with that. I don't know why anyone would have any issue with that. Well, okay, so to fill in the blanks there, you said, uh, why not? I actually, I will go ahead and, uh, this is all publicly viewable, by the way, publicly viewable, but um, one one reason why not is brought to us uh, by Matt Jack, in which he says that uh, people need to have sort of courage uh, and character of being able to state their views and being able to defend them. And, you know, his argument being that if you're unwilling to do that, then that's sort of a problem as well. Uh, if you if you can't necessarily take your votes being made publicly or being willing to defend your positions, then that could also be um, indicative of maybe your beliefs on the issue aren't very strong, etc. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that was something that was brought up as a reason why, you know, maybe hiding behind the curtain of anon anonymity uh wouldn't be desirable in this instance. So I know that that was one voice um, sort of against this proposed amendment. Well, um, yeah. I don't mind. Go ahead. Well, I think I, I didn't, I didn't, some people were talking about how, like, if you can't, if you can't take being whipped, then you're not fit for the world of politics or something like that. It wasn't as harsh as that, but it was on that lines. I didn't really like that because as much as that's true, what we saw in the recall vote was not people being whipped to vote a particular way. It was it was like really toxic. Like, you know, there's being whipped and then there's being toxic. And so I understand the reasoning for this amendment um but I think one of the issues with it is is just the practicalities of it, I think, because obviously for a high profile vote like that, it may be useful. But for something like, you know, a small change to the legal code just for technicalities or something, or some somebody being confirmed to the election commission where nobody really has any objection to it, I don't think you need to have a private ballot because that would just create unnecessary hassle. Um, but I think people should be given the option to vote privately, um, should they so wish, because they may not want to cast a vote in a toxic atmosphere like... That, but also saying that we shouldn't have a toxic atmosphere anyway. You know, I'd, we should work very hard to make sure debates are um, respectful. Civilized, I think, was the word that the yeah. speaker's office used. Civility. Yeah, yeah of course, that, and that's all true. But um, I mean, it is a reality that um, the North Pacific has a. Um, toxic some uh, toxic environment in its politics some uh now and again but uh so you have to live with that i think i don't think you can make policy on what could be what how you want it to be i don't think that is realistic um so 
I'm very much in favor of um, having secret ballots um, for the simple sake that people might not want to engage with the drama and just want to uh, get their vote out without being uh, harassed with a, la- a lack of better words uh, about it in the in the case of a very controversial um, action by the RA or something along those lines. Really, you're really putting the place over. Yeah, yeah obviously, you know, it, on an individual level, I think in order for the community to make that progress, I think on an individual level, uh, it does take a sort of uh, consideration to help us avoid sort of issues like that in the future. Um. But I will say, like, we, it was brought up, the logistical aspect by Ara, or the administrative aspect. One of the things that I was talking about early on with this amendment uh, was the practicality of it. Not that these are difficult questions necessarily, but in order for me to be willing to support something like this, which for the record I currently don't, um, I, I would have to have answers to these questions. First of all, I'd have to know how many people actually plan on using this. Because I don't think that legislating something for the sake of legislating it or reactively doing so is necessarily helpful. And I don't necessarily think that it would uh, alleviate the problem or the perceived problem of this situation, rather. But I also think that we have to be very clear about how this is implemented. I think that's probably, you know, the speaker's hat job. Not speaker's hat, but like deputy speaker. I've been a speaker in the past. Sort of that hat and persona coming on of okay how's this going to work guys do you know the election commission obviously fulfills that role with general elections and judicial elections so the obvious answer that people you know kind of came up with is okay well the speaker's office will fulfill that role for RA votes and okay that's fine but you then have to define to what extent are members of the speaker's office allowed to be involved in that process you know because if one of them, for example, were to propose a piece of legislation, are they then able to see the incoming anonymous ballots on that same amendment that's being voted upon? I would argue no. So you have to eliminate, you know, certain conflicts of interest, and then you kind of get down into the weeds of the implementation of that. And I think Ghost was one of the people who, in answering my questions, he's like, yeah, it's it's, it's not that overcomplicated. Like, it doesn't have to be that hard. And I would say that, no, it doesn't. But at the same time, I think in order to get everyone on board and to really like make sure that it, it, it is implemented in a way that's actually helpful, I think we have to be very honest with ourselves about how this is implemented, who it's handled by, why it's not handled by X person versus why it is handled by Y person. And obviously with any sort of change, you kind of you kind of have to iron out the kinks of that. And I think that a lot of kinks with this particular amendment would have to be ironed out before I'm willing to support it personally. That's just my standpoint of it. Um, I think... And, and... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go on. I didn't really have much else to add, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, but I think the um, one of the questions that um, I think about with this is that do you... When we're voting from from a legislative point of view, do we do people vote need to be held accountable for that vote? Because of course, one of the reasons that the the main reason we had the second recall vote is because I know Grundy's sitting in sitting in the audience right now, but because he voted last minute for himself. Um, but of course, if we had a private ballot, we wouldn't know that had happened, and we probably wouldn't have had the second recall vote. Yeah, so it definitely has an impact if you have it versus if you don't. I guess, I guess you know, I sort of did gloss over that at the beginning, and that's my mistake, maybe for better or for worse. But yeah, the reason the second recall vote even happened, I mentioned amidst controversy, was because of something that happened within the final few minutes of that vote, which was Garandu inserting his own vote into things, which, you know, upset a number of people. Some people didn't seem to have an issue with it. Some people did take great issue with it. Evidently enough people um, took issue with it in order for a second recall motion to be made and a second recall motion to succeed. So that is why there were duplicate uh, recall motions as opposed to just one and done. 
Um, and in light of that behavior, by the second time, uh, it seems that people uh, were a lot more willing to vote in support of the recall. So yeah, obviously having private ballots would have impacted that. Um, in, in a world where there are private ballots, maybe, maybe that isn't the case. Maybe the second recall vote doesn't happen. But uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I think that um, there can be something said for especially public officials. And I don't I don't mean to have us create a separate classification for people who are holding office versus aren't as far as like what voting rights and stuff they're entitled because obviously that wouldn't make sense. But I think that there is value in especially like when a delegate has a legislative agenda or something like that, being able to have those references to point back to and be like, hey, on this, you voted X, and that may or may not be consistent with what you're saying now. What's changed or, you know, things of that nature, because even on the citizenship rolls, the citizenship resident registry, which is publicly viewable, uh, I know that they, the Speaker's office keeps, like, logs of who's voted this way, and anyone can go check as far as individual people's voting histories. So if private ballots become a thing, you lose that as well. And it's a matter of, do you value that? Do you think that those sort of logs are unnecessary? Uh, or do you think that, you know, that's just part of a healthy functioning democracy to help keep people accountable to, you know, maybe past positions they might've held? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. Uh, it really depends on where you stand on the issue. And so far, over I believe three pages of debate, that's uh, it, it's been it's been contested. I knew. I think. I think perhaps a compromise. I know. I think someone may have suggested this. I can't quite remember, but having like releasing the the voting results at the end of the vote, because then we don't have um, the toxicity we had during the vote for the recall. But then we also have the ability to hold people accountable just just a suggestion but um yeah the, this is well we're addressing things that have already happened but sort of staying in the realm of the ra but things that are currently happening uh the flexible territories act is currently at vote uh that actually recently came to vote just earlier today as a matter of fact and the discussion was started earlier by our very own i believe it was yeah yeah, our very own uh, Comfed, uh, Minister of Defense by day, maybe legal mind of the region by evening or night, depending on where you are in the world. But a discussion was started over legal reforms. I personally have not had a chance to read through that thread. Um, if either of you have, I'd love to hear your input. I know that the Chief Justice is here in our audience, if maybe, you know, I don't know that he'd have anything that I wanted to say about that, but I do know that it's been brought up and a few people have engaged with it already as far as, you know, that was another thing that was kind of brought up by the whole controversy with um, the ex-delegate was what what legal avenues are appropriate to take and when, how can you, uh, what are some safeguards against bad actors, this and that. Thankfully, we didn't see any of that, but it, it is something that's entered the public conscience as far as we have a lot of measures in place to make sure that the worst case scenario doesn't end up happening. Uh, I think the crux of this discussion was mostly Comfred referencing something that happened during the Mad Jack trial, which we have covered here before on NBS, but the Mad Jack trial in which Cretox was uh, one of the members of the Defense Council alongside Dredton. Uh, he, he pointed out several things in his message to the region, and I think Comfred, this was brought about by him wanting to follow up on that. Like I said, I haven't had the chance to uh, read through that yet, but if either of you did, then we can definitely uh, discuss it. I did read it, but I wasn't really concentrated. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but I think, okay. from the sounds of it, in I think most of it references the um, MJ trial, and from the sounds of it, some mistakes, and it's, this sounds quite political, but some mistakes are made on both sides. And yeah, perhaps there is room there is room for reform there. I've been advised by attempted socialism to remind you, per my earlier comment, that he is here as a citizen and not as the Chief Justice. That is absolutely correct. But for for any uh, disclaimer reasons, I just 
needed to let him know that yes, that is the case. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. We lo- we love having live audiences. It's always a good time. Um. So yeah, that that kind of wraps up the RA business. Obviously, the big juicy thing that everyone might want to sink their teeth into is the prohibition of relations and how that's not necessarily a uh, usual characteristic of TNP to take such action. But yeah, one of our final topics for today's episode is the activity in the court. Yes, yes, we mentioned in the RA there's legal, there's a court reform, judicial reform uh, discussions going. But in the court, there is concrete, actual happenings, which would be the latest court case in the series of court cases. Exciting. North Pacific, but Kekistan and Grand England. But yeah, they, they don't, don't, down. They don't even seem to know that one trial. Well, that, yeah, that's another, that's another matter it, entirely. You see, no, it's hilarious. Oh, my God. The kicker here is that there are co-defendants. Uh, St. George, a.k.a. Mad Jack, filed the uh, indictment request, which was accepted by the court, to uh, their own trial for treason. What have they done, you asked? A treason trial? Isn't that usually a pretty high-profile trial? Indeed, that would be the case. However, our defendants uh, seem to have spoke about their actions on a publicly viewable R&B. Uh, casting is aspirations the right, right word? I don't know if I'm using this word correctly. But without casting any aspirations on the trial, that might not be the right word, that doesn't sound right. Uh, Just a sequence of events. Attempted socialism is the moderating justice. Uh, We have standby hearing officers, temporary hearing officers, because Bailey is currently the vice delegate ghost here. A prosecutor has been appointed, however, as Ara just remarked, do the defendants know that they are on trial? Well, per their rights, of course, they have to be made aware that they are on trial. And Dredton, their appointed defense counsel, has made them aware that they are in trial. But as it appears, uh, they have not responded. In fact, as of today, earlier today, Dredton mentioned that the defendants have not responded and that the defense is ready for sentencing. (laughs) Guys, if you are going to beat a treason case, the best way is to not be absent for your treason case. But hey, what do I know? I've never been on charge for treason, thankfully. But yes, that is that is. I mean, my belief is then is aware that he, like well, they have to be aware. It's just. I mean, well, yeah, I believe he's like mocked the court or something on the R and B, but oh, well. not sure. I haven't followed it. The Almighty Gather and Big Justices will rain down upon you, and yeah, something like that. <laughs> but now I so, just I was just gonna go ahead and mention it because it's not every day you get a treason case, and yeah. It, it is a notable event inherently just because it's happening. As far as, like, actual meat, though, I'm not sure that there's really much to delve into considering... Uh, it's like all, of the, all of the evidence uh, was ordered to be preserved by the Chief Justice, to which I believe it was. But yeah, the evidence is not some uh, screenshotted Discord logs or, you know, maybe a paste bin of a whole bunch of conversation. No, it is it is literally nations talking on the RMB. Either of you want to say anything about the court case? I don't really think that there's much there, but it's just one big shit show, and I hope it ends soon. It's all you can really hope for—a speedy resolution. Well, all right. Today is actually a bit of a shorter episode than I anticipated. We're just now nearing the one-hour mark. Uh, thank you to our wonderful listeners who are here for us. But yeah, thank you yeah. both for being here. Shout out to Ara, our newest broadcaster, for coming on being part of the show absolutely it's always a nice time thank you very much thank you very much um attempted socialism mentions no comments on the mountain of r for yes actually thank you for reminding me that is something that we need to tackle uh or at least reference i have not followed those r for r i've only followed i followed one because i put an i put a uh whatever this is really showing my i put in a brief Mm -hmm. brief that's the word i'm looking for but yes the office of the court examiner has been quite busy lately. That would, of course, be T. Lums, the R court examiner, who has put forth not one, not two, not three. That is the five time, five time, five time R for R submitting. <laughs> uh, shout out Booker T. There is, and I'll read these each. The candidate on, regarding on candidate eligibility and reopening nomination periods. 
regarding on delegate term limits in special elections, regarding advisory opinion of the Court of the North Pacific, regarding on the vice delegates voting rights within the Security Council, and finally, regarding on the time at which oaths become binding. These are a number of legal questions. Busy. These are a number of legal questions on which the court has decided in the past. Uh, what the court examiner seems to be aiming for in these requests of reviews is basically just to bring these past rulings up to with modern standards. Uh, the modern standards obviously having changed since a lot of these uh, opinions were written. So to eliminate a lot of the legal inconsistencies that thereby come about, uh, you have these requests for reviews on a number of topics, but a lot of these date back 2013, 2012, 2015. Yeah, no, the the court, they're hard at work. Uh, Ghost was forcibly removed from his work because he was called to be acting vice delegate. But I, the, the Turtle and Elu and AS, I'm sure, are hard at work in solving these r for rs and getting us the answers that we so desire. But yes, no, that was actually quite important for us to mention. Uh, he mentions, as a diligent court follower may have picked up, the court has moved steadily towards a set of reforms and has requested public feedback on several topics. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's another thing to kind of supplement the whole discussion in the RA about legal reforms. Uh, it's kind of sort of slowly happening, just bringing up these past questions, bringing up these past opinions and kind of, you know, motioning them along. Uh, the court... In acting in their capacity as Chief Justice, they seem to be asking for feedback from the community as to how they can go about this. That seems to be something that has happened um, within the past week or so. So yeah, things are happening all around. Executive activity, legislative activity, judicial activity. Don't get it twisted. Even with a lot of uh, unusual irregularities, if we will, the gears are still turning all areas. Things are happening. Um, and yeah, I personally am excited for the next term. I think it'll be an interesting opportunity. Yeah. I think Absolutely. there's a lot that can be done. So, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in, um, how the next delegate is going to tackle, um, NBS as it's been very active this term. And I wonder if there might be a chance that, you know, the Ministry of Radio might return or anything of the sort, right? So putting it out out there, uh, the, just saying, um, for anyone in the audience that might be interested in running for delegate, I'm sure I know who I would want as Minister of Radio. Is it you? Mm -hmm. No. Hell no. Why would I want that? Why would I be in the third radio? Is it you, but in a clever, yet not so uh, apparent disguise? No. No. It is someone on this panel, though. Dang, that's crazy. All right. Well, anyway, this has been NBS. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of our listeners. It's always good to get on here and record. Um, hopefully, we'll have a quick turnaround time on this episode. If we don't, don't quote me on that, but hopefully we will. Anyway, thank you to everyone, and this is going to be NBS signing off. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.